Hey everyone, good evening. Welcome to tonight's ASE webinar. I want to do a quick audio check here to make sure that everybody can hear me okay, as well as see my screen. Looks like thus far we've got about 30 people in the room. Okay, if I can get a couple more of you to feedback, uh, you can just type into your questions pane the, uh, <clears throat> that you can see and hear everything okay. Okay, looks like we're starting to get some feedback. Okay, well again, welcome everyone. Thanks for dropping by tonight, and we are glad you're with us, with us on this uh, July evening. Just as a follow-up so everyone knows, tonight's event is going to be recorded for review at a later date and time. So if you need to tell someone who couldn't join us this evening or you just want to revisit this session later on, we've got that covered. We usually post a recorded event within 24 hours, so watch your email for a follow-up and look to the ASC website in the News and Events section uh, under Multimedia. Tonight's webinar is Tests of Integrity, an inside look at how ASE tests are developed. This is a topic that's often misunderstood. Uh, I think people have a lot of false perceptions sometimes of how ASE develops its questions. And um, hopefully we can uh, help set some of that straight a little bit and clear up some of those misperceptions and misinterpretations of how we do things here. As for tonight's webinar team, We've got Julie White standing by to help from ASE Customer Service. Julie will be keeping an eye on your questions and comments. Also joining us tonight from ASE's Test Development Department, we have Dan Baumhart. Dan's going to help us out with some of the intricacies of ASE test development. As tonight's webinar presenter, my name is Dave Capert, and I'd like to express my personal welcome and thanks for joining us this evening for this brief look at what goes on inside ASE test development. Let's take a minute now to just go over the online interface. First, make sure your speakers are turned on and set to your liking. Sounds like that's not a problem out there at all. The content of the presentation, that's going to be the information I'm presenting, is going to be in a viewer window shown on your left. Although you won't be able to speak directly with us on this end, you can enter your questions in the questions pane in the control panel. We invite your participation during tonight's session to make it as interactive as possible. We'll handle your questions at convenient commercial breaks during the event, and we'll also have a question session at the end. It's just going to depend on how many questions we have. But by all means, go ahead and enter them when they come to mind. It doesn't mean we'll be able to answer them immediately, but uh, as we proceed through the session, we will definitely monitor that and get an answer to you. Now, some of you may be joining us on mobile devices. The apps for both iOS and the Android OS now give full webinar functionality. You can get the iOS version from the Apple App Store or the Android version from the Google Play Store if you haven't done so already. Let's hope that you're already there. Otherwise, you're going to have to run off and do that. Okay, so tonight we're going to cover the following topics. We're going to talk about ASE being an industry-driven program. And the heart of our presentation tonight is really going to be uh, workshops and the product that those workshops produce. We'll get into the life cycle of an ASE test question. And then, of course, we'll have your Q&A formally at the end. But again, go ahead and enter those as we proceed through the session tonight. <clears throat> now, what I like to do is uh, always have polling questions in our webinar so that we can have people interact with us and kind of gauge what's going on in the head of our audience out there. So what I'd like to do first of all here, you just bear with me momentarily, is I want to go ahead and launch the first of tonight's polls. So 
So there you have it. What is our general impression about ASE test questions? And I'm going to give this probably about another oh, 30 seconds here while everybody tallies up. Um, at one point, you weren't able to answer polling questions on the mobile devices, but I'm um, happy to report that now that functionality is, is there. All right, give me just about another 10 seconds here. It's probably about as good as I'm going to get. Let's go ahead and close that out, and let me share the results with you. So it looks like we have, I guess, Dan, it makes you look good from test development. 42% said that they're well-written and fair. We got 20 26% about tricky and designed to mislead. We hear that one quite a bit, and that they have more than one right answer. We hear that one quite a bit. And it uh, looks like we've got um, about 3% saying they're, they're manufacturer-specific, and another 3% tying that at they are often outdated. OK, great. Now I'm going to hide that. And I'm going to get right into the meat of the presentation. First thing of the underpinnings of our test development is I want to remind everyone that ASE has, always was, and continues to be an industry-driven program. When ASE started in 1972 as an alternative to mandatory technician licensing at that point, we were founded by the then existing Motor Vehicle Manufacturers Association and the National Automobile Dealers Association, again, as an alternative to mandatory licensing. And the thought was at that time that as an industry-driven program, the industry would come together to uh, come up with a certification program and the various tests to address those issues. And again, that's been that way since 1972 and continues to be so to this day. I'm going to talk about workshops for a minute. Uh, no matter which workshop I'm going to just briefly describe here, each one of them consists of somewhere in the range of 15 to 20 subject matter experts that work in the industry and not for ASE. These experts represent a cross-section of the service industry, including working technicians, technical trainers, and educators. This representation spans both the original equipment and aftermarket side of the business. ASC plays a facilitator role in the work, managing the workshop flow and keeping the process on track. While ASC has its own technical experts on staff, they play a neutral role in test content so that all tests, both new and revised, remain the product of subject matter expert involvement. First type of workshop we're going to talk about here briefly is a feasibility workshop. The feasibility workshop explores the viability of a new test or testing program to determine whether it's got any credibility to go forward. It's the end result of interest by the industry in a given test series and or a specialty area. Question writing workshops are most common at ASE and we'll go over those details in just a moment. A job analysis workshop conducts a task review to see whether the tasks covered in the test are pertinent to the working world today. For instance, Wheel cylinder rebuilding is no longer covered on the A5 brakes test. This has created room for questions about advanced braking systems such as ABS and traction control. ASE usually combines job analysis and question writing into one workshop. And then the other type of workshop we have is passing score, which uh, contrary to what some people believe, ASE tests are not graded on a curve. There is a passing score that is set by an industry group, again, at a separate workshop. And when they set that score, that basically is the bar that is established for what the 
minimum level of knowledge of the skills would be as demonstrated on that ASE certification exam. Okay, now let's look at the life cycle of an ASE test question. This is broken down into, well, I'll show, I guess it'll show eight steps, but it's really, some of them are kind of combined. But nonetheless, look at these first two up on the screen about question written at a workshop and question reviewed by a workshop group. The way it works is this. Test questions are developed at test writing workshops, which are comprised, again, of between 15 and 20 technical experts. A separate three-day test writing workshop is conducted about every three years, depending on the test, and some of them are sooner, such as on our advanced exams. Before the first question is written at a workshop, the technical experts review and modify existing job skills or tasks necessary for the technician to perform successfully in a particular job category, well, let's say steering and suspension. And then using the task list as a guide, individual test questions are written. Each question is reviewed and modified until accepted by the entire workshop group. The questions that are accepted are then pre-tested. That is, they're embedded in the exam. That is an actual ASE test to determine their performance. Test takers are unaware of which questions are being pre-tested. The answers to these pre-test questions do not affect the test score in any way. And the reason we do that is if you knew that they were pre-test questions, then you may look at those and interpret them differently or realize the fact that you're not going to be scored on them, so you, you may not do your best on those questions. So that's why we, we basically, you know, if you want to say stealth mode, but we embed them in the test. And then down the road, because those questions have, or because those questions have gone through the pre-test phase, then they become credible questions for other AAC exams going forward. Based on how question performs in a pretest, it will become an actual test question or sent back to a future workshop where it will be either modified and pretested again or thrown out. Even after the question passes the rigors of pretesting, it continues to be monitored. Every question is statistically tracked for proper performance. We continue tracking the questions until basically at some point they're going to become obsolete. And at that point, when that question is technically obsolete, it's thrown out, discarded basically, won't appear on an ASE test again. Now I want to launch the second poll. And again, because we have uh, Dan with us tonight, Dan may be able to address a little bit more in detail some of your questions about the specifics of the tests and development. Give this just a few more seconds. Just ten more seconds. Right, I'm going to go ahead and close it out. And I'll share it with you. Okay, it looks like uh, 
some of that helped as far as the understanding of the ASE question development process. Um, and maybe Dan can uh, pitch in here a little bit and give us a little bit more detail. I see a couple questions coming into the uh, into the question window about standard for proper performance on a question and those sorts of things. I'm going to go and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to hide this poll. Dan, are you open to jump in here for a second and talk about maybe how the performance on the questions work as far as when they're developed and tracked and embedded? I, in sure, I sure am, Dave. Um, can you hear me okay? I, I can hear you good. I'm going to go ahead and mute myself so I don't talk over you or vice versa. So can, I'll let you talk for a little bit with that. Can you put back the, uh, the uh, pathing of the uh, process there for me, Dave? Yeah, let me back up. Is that up possible? Here. Uh -huh. Thank you, sir. As Dave gets back that direction, there are a couple folks asked uh, uh, specifically what are the stand what standard denotes proper question performance. Um, like to talk to you just a little bit about how that works. Um, let's uh, when a, the question that's written in a workshop, the workshop group reviews it. That group of workshop participants are subject matter experts from across the country. Uh, they vary from. Uh, 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 subject matter experts that work in uh, manufacturer specific dealerships for training uh, departments for um, uh, independent repair facilities for dealership repair facilities also equipment manufacturers it's a pretty diverse group when they uh, write a question it has to fit that task list that uh, really is the job description for a candidate seeking their credential once that's done they approve it modify and approve it, make it as generic as possible. So, <clears throat> for instance, items, there's an item on the A6 electrical exam that's a power window uh, circuit, um, and the uh, candidate that calls me that's having some questions about some of the items, they'll say, you know, well, the test is General Motors in nature. Well, that window circuit is actually out of a Toyota. Um, and when you look at it, um, the uh, Toyota circuit, it is a Toyota circuit, the General Motors technician uh, looks at it and goes, that's not my circuit, may not be his circuit, it's more a line art drawing. We try to make them very generic. <clears throat> they are also trying to get specifically to the uh, root uh, performance of the item, not specific to how the system operates from manufacturer to manufacturer, but how the system operates generically. When it's pre-tested and embedded in the test, the statistics come back and tell us essentially how well the item performs and how well it uh, differentiates a less than knowledgeable candidate from a knowledgeable candidate and how well it performs in its difficulty in general. Um, we monitor that performance then as that item moves on to the regular exam and make sure it continues to perform well or consistently. The um, uh, question performance, if it drops off, say for instance like Dave discussed those items that related to rebuilding of hydraulic components on a uh, brake system. Those, those items in general were getting more and more difficult and your peers said we, those no longer have a place in the exam. We don't do that anymore. We're unit replacement now. We don't rebuild those often enough for them, that content to be on the exam and the statistics showed that. They proved that out. Um, the, if that question starts uh, becoming more and more difficult, we'll pull those out of the pool and then bring them to the uh, item writing workshop to have your peers review them before they continue on in the exam. Um, if it becomes technically obsolete, then it's gone. Uh, we move on and new questions are always being produced so that it's not difficult to replace those. Um, the uh, full length exam again is where you're going to see uh, pretest items on the uh, recertifiers. We don't uh, allow that uh, to occur. You would simply see a half-length exam without any pretest items, so you're seeing the real stuff uh, there and don't have to worry about uh, editing back or forth. Um, 
let me think for just a second here. Um, all the ASC exams are built to the same difficulty each administration cycle. So if you took an ASC exam five years ago, the same exam now is at the same difficulty for those candidates that are seeing it for the first time. Um, the same is true for the recertification exams. And a recertifier that took the exam uh, five years ago, this exam that they take this cycle is at the same difficulty. Um, the exams in general for the recertifiers seem to be getting easier, and that's because you're five years further down uh, your career path, and you're that much more knowledgeable. You've been exposed to that much more um, uh, work experience, uh, different types of problems, different uh, uh, repair scenarios. It's diagnosis and repairs. Um, the, uh, each uh, exam maintains now in this current uh, format the same uh, pass score. Okay, so for instance, when Dave mentioned the pass score workshop, we do a workshop to determine the pass, initial pass score. We monitor that. Your peers monitor that. We do. We uh, monitor the. Uh, difficulty exam in general, if the difficulty is trending, and then if there's a need for readjusting a pass score, we bring your peers in and we discuss that and make decisions. The pass scores are very solid. Very infrequently are they changing now. Um, uh, in the past, we used to have to post a quite exam, so you had to wait for results. Now we use a complicated uh, scientific method to pre-equate the exam content um, to make sure that the uh, 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 the, t the cut score remains the same. So, for instance, if you took a test and the passing score was 31, and then you go take the exam again, and you got a 30, 30 and you take the exam again, and the passing score went to 32, and you got a 31, the test is doing its job. You're still at the cut score. You may not have studied or may not have been exposed to any more content. Um, but the that trending of the exam up or down to handle the candidate uh, population uh, knowledge base is, is difficult for us to, to do. So now we do that on the other end. It's hard for you guys to handle the score moving. So they're very, very solid now. Um, the, uh, uh, what, what else would I like to say about this? Um, uh, on the pretest items, um, Many of those pretest items that you see come through are is content. It's all content approved by your peers. They come forward uh, through the process, and if they are very difficult, they get pushed aside and go back to the workshop. If they're very easy, they get pushed aside and go back to the workshop. If they're right in the middle, um, then they stay in the exam pool to be brought in at a later time on later forms. Frequently, when an exam item is written, it makes it through the uh, uh, main pool of items or the, the regular certifiers, I'll, we'll take them to recertification exams to confirm through the comments coming back from the recertifiers that that content is, is good as well. Um, let's see. Um, one of the questions was who proofs the diagrams on the ASE exam? Um, the, in general, the proof is done by um, uh, the test administrators for the exam. Um, it's very difficult to get a final drawing, a line art drawing, uh, um, finished and wrapped up in the workshop process. Uh, a lot of times uh, an item is, is written on or, or typed up and submitted to us electronically at the workshop, and then we have to modify the wiring schematic to make it more generic line art and move it away from a manufacturer specific schematic, or we have to uh, add meters. Um, um, at test points uh, like W, X, Y, and Z, which is frequently how we handle making the items a little bit easier for candidates to parse out the wiring schematics by putting out the, uh, uh, calling out the points on the exam, on the uh, uh, wiring schematic that we want you to focus. Um, the uh, idea behind what we're doing now is to move all the exam items, the uh, illustrations, to reduce scrolling, but uh, increase the font size as large as possible, and the uh, uh, illustration itself as large as possible, so that you can get as much detail as possible on that exam, because we do not have a zoom function or a way to blow up the diagram in the current platform. Um, I think that answers that one. Uh, one of the folks. Um, 
one of the folks made a, a comment about um, some uh, test item that was uh, uh, manufacturer specific. Occasionally, uh, an item will be written and your peers will approve it and it will look very manufacturer specific from your perspective. Those concern us because then that could affect the performance of the item for specific candidate groups. For instance, if a manufacturer has a system that works multiple ways, uh, depending on the model year or type of system, um, uh, uh, configuration and we post a question regarding that and it's not generic enough or doesn't call out enough detail to move it away from that manufacturer specific system the performance of that item can be suspect so having comment sheets or being able to comment at the ex end of the exam is very valuable for us even if you just simply put the item number uh, say it was number 15 of the A6 exam that you when you saw it and then uh, your name and contact information because we'll be able to pull up your exam uh, and then pull that item up and get some specific information from it. Um, the, uh, uh, one of the comments was uh, uh, asked if when we're saying we're taking a circuit out of a Toyota, et cetera, are we using factory manuals and documentation or aftermarket schematics? Well, the goal is to make them as generic as possible. So where they initially come from depends on the author. So if the author of the item is a Toyota technician using Toyota service information, the wiring schematic may come directly out of there and then is genericized. Usually in front of the workshop group, we call out the, line, the uh, items that will be included in line art, uh, include then wiring schematics. We use a, uh, a document camera that produces the uh, wiring schematic from a print document sitting on the table, projects it onto a screen uh, at the front of the room so that we can discuss the item to make sure that it looks good so and, and fits correctly. Um, frequently aftermarket schematics like an all day uh, a Mitchell schematic would be very helpful because those are line art reproductions of the original and then uh, that makes it a little bit easier for us to build at the front of the room, but that's not often, uh, not in general, always the case. Frequently, we're using a manufacturer specific and then modifying it. Um, there are some questions regarding um, uh, Dave regarding the uh, the more generic in nature, away from the content of this particular webinar. Um, I'd like to just take a minute and answer one of them. Um, one of the uh, 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 folks monitoring this today has a concern about the time frame available for the test and that uh, they would like more time. And ASC does offer um, uh, accommodations for uh, under the ADA Act to allow more time should you have a documented disability. If you don't have that, there have been webinars that we've done in the past that talk specifically about how to manage the testing platform to maximize your testing time. So there's some specific webinars that are available in the uh, archive that will address that for you and give you a better, uh, better description of the tools available to you to move through the exam quicker and uh, handle the items you know, uh, mark the ones you don't, and then uh, uh, or are questionable, and then leave the ones alone that you don't, and then go back and answer all the questions. Um, do you have? I, Dave, I think I've answered everybody's question right about there. Should we wait for a couple more here? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, I'm just trying to think through any other details. I think, Dan, you gave that good overview there of uh, you know, more of the internal stuff that goes on, actually, you know, as you've headed workshops and have worked with SMEs, um, so on and so forth. Um, one of the things that uh, should be explained to Dave before we move on too far is that how we mine the subject matter experts, okay? Often um, the manufacturers provide their uh, subject matter experts to ASE in support of the exams. So they will send us <coughs> candidates or uh, subject matter experts that they feel are appropriate for that specific exam. Uh, they have knowledge or expertise or handling the curriculum for that exam for a manufacturer or for a training uh, department or developer. They'll, <clears throat> they'll also uh, 
we'll also mine from uh, candidates that contact us. If a candidate contacts us and they have a question about an item, uh, we may find that their uh, knowledge base, their attitude, um, their ability to describe uh, uh, in detail the, the concern they have with an item uh, will be very helpful for us to make decisions to pull those type of people in. Um, uh, you know, I, we participate in trade shows. Uh, the Vision Conference in Kansas City uh, is a big uh, trade show, huge trade show that we attend, and many of the ASA uh, uh, conventions and, and conferences we attend, as well as others. Um, NAPA, um, uh, uh, go, we attend uh, training uh, classes from many, many of the manufacturers. Um, and in doing so, we mine subject matter experts from those as well. Um, the goal there is to find people that fit well into the workshop group, that are knowledgeable, that work well with the other folks in, in that are supporting the exam, and come to the table to, to really promote ASE. But not necessarily do those folks that uh, come to the workshop, we don't really require them to be ASE certified. We want folks that are doing the job every day. The questions are, in general, written by candidates that uh, by candidates that do the work every day, for candidates that do the work every day. And the ASC exams, uh, specific to the mechanical side, are um, uh, exams about diagnosis and repair of vehicles that are exhibiting problems. Um, that, you know, the part specialist exam is specific to uh, candidates that, uh, written by candidates or, or subject matter experts that have knowledge and experience and work uh, uh, dealing with the uh, part sales operations in various retailers, um, jobbers, and for manufacturers as well. The um, another thing too, and as part of that workshop, uh, David mentioned earlier, we. Uh, the first thing that's done in a workshop after introductions is to um, uh, have the uh, candidates or the subject matter experts review the what ASC calls a study guide or what your peers may call a task list or a job description for the candidate that's seeking their credential. It has all the tasks listed under the specific content areas of that exam. That's the foundation for the exam. That's been discussed before in other webinars and again available on the archives. That once that is reviewed, only items that are written specific to one of those tasks will be included in an exam. So for ASC, the study guide or guidebook that you can get for free from the ASC website under uh, test prep and training, those guides are really the, the foundation or the roadmap for the ASC exams, those tasks that are in there. So if a task says uh, understand uh, or um, uh, uh, determine the uh, uh, source of a pull in a brake exam. You need to be able to, to manage that if it's in the hydraulic section, what hydraulic component could do that. If it's in the mechanical section, maybe uh, the parking brake or something to that effect, or even the uh, uh, another area, maybe there's a, a brake pull caused by a, a contaminated brake linings. Um, you need to be able to parse that out. Um, so that's our best study guide. Um, also work experience, um, uh, arming yourself with uh, uh, work that is really uh, challenges you and and in, improves your entire uh, uh, exposure to different technologies and different uh, work experiences. That's very important. Um, on the ASC does this very similar uh, test development for uh, on the NATEF side. The NATEF is our accreditation wing that accredits uh, high schools and colleges or post-secondary schools, secondary and post-secondary. Uh, schools and in that particular case, many of the subject matter experts that come in for there are uh, secondary educators, and they participate in those workshops. Again, same idea there as we participate in events such as uh, uh, the teacher conferences and the uh, uh, instructor conferences in the summertime. Uh, meet instructors at specific events, uh, again like the vision event. Um, then we uh, mine those folks for participation uh, later at specific workshops in support of the NATEF. Um, but secondary instructors are part of uh, the regular ASC product as well, but there, uh, many of them are, are focused for them as we use them for the 
NATEF uh, credential, the NATEF exams on that side. Uh, Dan, I just want to call everybody's attention. I'm sure by now if they haven't noticed, they never will, but just a list of resources that um, <clears throat> we feel as ASE staff are probably some of the more beneficial in terms of helping you out with different things. Um, obviously, there's the main ASE website uh, where you can go to a test center locator. Um, we have demos on my ASE, which is how you, you know, register and schedule exams these days. We've got demos built to help you show you how to do that. You've got some content on YouTube under our channel of ASC tests. We have a special section just on CBT because we know that not everybody's taken a CBT test, so that transition continues to go on. Dan mentioned our study guides. We have those available. Uh, one little product we have that's helpful is the tips for ASC test taking, which helps orient you to the different styles of ASC test questions and lets you play with them a little bit. And there's some remediation in there to help you coach you in terms of how to interpret those questions more more accurately. Um, and then we have a CBT test drive, which is basically a, uh, a walkthrough of the test interface like you would see at most of the main Prometric centers, not the satellite centers, but the main centers, um, which also gives you a chance to look at the review screen, which we talked about in last month's webinar on, uh, on test saving, or time saving tips, I should say, when taking an ASC test. The other thing I would just want to share real quickly with you is we do have, under news and events and multimedia on the ASC website, we have a listing of different multimedia products, but a growing family of recorded webinars where we try to, again, get these up within about a 24-hour period. So you can always come back and look at it. And recently, we've also been adding, for those that are interested, getting back to the portable devices, uh, versions that are in MPEG-4 so you can view them. And they do work pretty well. Um, again, we have a growing number of people. I want to do it. It looks like about 40% of our audience anymore is now viewing these events on, on mobile devices. So um, sometimes they're nice. You can, uh, you, know, you can go through and look at that when maybe you're, you're hanging in an airport or, or waiting for an appointment or, or whatever. But um, we're trying to make that more friendly with uh, various platforms that our users have out there. Um, also, I just want to mention real quick that as always, we have our test registration open until August 21st. We are testing until August 31st. Um, there is a survey at the end of this webinar that uh, will launch after the webinar ends and concludes. If you would please take a few moments and go through that. And then just real quickly, not related to the content of tonight's webinar, I just wanted to pass along um, some real news here at ASE. Uh, we've been getting a lot of questions from the industry about HFO 1234YF refrigerant. I'm sure many of you are in that boat of wondering, you know, what's going on with it. <clears throat> we just learned within about the past week about the requirements for the new program, and we are currently in the process of developing that. You will see that coming out later on this year. So, um, and that will include content on uh, CO2 refrigerant as well, because that is now an accepted alternative by the US EPA. So I can't give you any definite timeline on that, but since we've been getting so many calls on that, that I just wanted to make sure that everybody knows that um, you know we are addressing that. We're working on it right now to update um, you know our Section 609, what's known as uh, an EPA lingo as a certification program. Uh, it's our uh, ASE Refrigerant Recovery Review and Quiz. So you'll be seeing that coming up later on. With that, I don't have any other comments or info at this time. I don't know if anybody else does before we close out. Okay, well, on behalf of ASE, Dan Baumhart, Julie White, and uh, myself, Dave Capert, I'd like to thank you all for attending tonight. Again, this will be a recorded event. Uh, continue to watch your inbox for other ASC webinars. We're trying to make these a regular event on various topics. And one of the survey questions, as you will see, will be what would be one of the topics you may want to see. We certainly are open to ideas on that and want to help you out in any way we can. Thanks for your support of ASE, and uh, pleasant evening to everyone. Thanks again for attending.